for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday evening, December the 30th, 1983. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker of the evening. This is one of toots of this service. And I often think about that scripture, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And I like that to be my testimony, for God is with us here. And I don't think that any of us would ever say the presence of God has not been in this place this week. And I praise God for that presence, that holy presence. And when you think about all of the evil spirits that have been cast out, and yet the presence of God has overwhelmed all of that. Isn't that, isn't that just, just beautiful? Some woman came in tonight and told me how, how the Lord had just uh, blessed her and healed her lungs. And we, the ladies upstairs, we had one day of where we just were praying against cigarettes. Not that any of them were still smoking, maybe one or two, but all of the results, the powers that, that had come into them from cigarettes from years ago and injured their lungs. I can say that my aunt was one of the very first women smokers in the state of Missouri. She lived in Hannibal, Missouri, and she started to smoke when no other women were smoking. And I can also say that she was one of the very first patients at the City of Hope Cancer Hospital in California and one of the first to die there. And she died... She drowned in her own juice. And you people, she drowned. Literally, her lungs just filled up and drowned her in her sleep. And any of you people that are smoking, you need to think about that. You really do. If Jesus is down in your heart and you're taking those drags on those cigarettes, you're just blowing smoke in Jesus' face. If he'd walk in here tonight, and he is in here tonight, but would you walk up and blow smoke in his face? You need to think about these things. And I do praise God for the anointing that, that just destroys the powers of the enemy. And for Brother um, Bob Mixon and his wife, I just appreciate them so much. He just Every morning he's just given us joy and edified us and lifted us up. You know, sometimes you need a lot of that in order to stand what, what is good you're going to be faced with in the deliverance service in the afternoon. <laughs> you really do. How many enjoyed Bob's ministry? And wasn't that good? <laughs> He just bubbles all the time, and, and Patty just said a while ago he'll probably have his little four-year-old son prophesying by the time he gets back here next time, <laughs> because that child's just like Bob. <laughs> and Brother Norman Parrish and his wife and the twins, we just uh, have enjoyed those, and those are profound sermons he's been preaching. You may not understand everything about them, but I want to go tediously over everything from the tape and listen to that over, because it, we need to get it over and over. We need, we need to try to reach for that highest realm, that third realm. That's what he's trying to bring us into and make us hungry to work for it. I've never, been, I've never understood when these people get up and say, you can't do it by works. Well, I think that we all have to do some things. I was telling somebody last night, God's not going to come, come down and hit me with a glory hammer. I can sit up there in my house and, and claim God's going to come down and wash my dishes and I can do that for 40 years, and he's not going to come down and wash my dishes. I have to get up and do it. And he was trying to tell us that, that we have things to do in order to enter into this very elect. Glenn, I've been talking about that for maybe three or four months, about the very elect. How many want to be in that crowd of the very elect? And I think that, that Brother Parrish has brought those messages. Maybe... When you buy the tapes, when you get the tapes and you go back over them, I know we're all going to see so much more. And, and the tapes of Brother uh, Holzhauser, wasn't that, wasn't that just a masterpiece this afternoon? Incredible. 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 I just wish that the whole world, every church, could hear that sermon. 
And I, I pray that the, the Lord will help Patty and I and Ruth to transcribe those tapes in a way that, you know, they go out to 6,500 Assembly of God ministers. And uh, the, uh, the magazine does. And we get some very lovely letters from Assembly of God ministers. Some of them have called up and said, we hurt. You say in here, you'll pray for people that hurt. We hurt. We've been hurt bad. And we've prayed. And many of them have bought tapes. And if they didn't buy them, sometimes we sent them to them anyway. <laughs> Just gave them to them because we wanted them to hear. You know, lots of people have not had the privilege of hearing what we've heard this week. That's right. That's right. They haven't had that privilege. I praise God for that tape that, that we got. I don't know how we ever got it. That first tape way back in 65, was it? Six, somewhere back in there, a tape that Brother Parrish had made, and, and no, he didn't anything about it. oh, didn't you? Somebody made it, and he was on there talking, and and also the magazines that came from down there at that time. We I don't know how the Lord just did it because they just felt you know for 35 years before we sat in that church, and we we were faithful, and God does honor faithfulness, but no real good stuff fell in our hands like that magazine that opened up deliverance to us so much and that tape and it, it just seemed to come from every direction we went to Canada and uh, things were opened up unto us magazines were given to us and things we'd never heard of before and it was just like food angel food cake just just we just devoured it and I praise God that we can send this magazine out they go out to 32,000 homes and that's a lot it costs a lot of money every other month it costs $3,600 to send those out and get them printed and we do most of the work Patty and I do all the typing, and Glenn does the layout work and writes in it, and I write in it, and, and other people write in it, and then we have it printed, and then it takes hours and hours to get it ready for the post office, and, and then we get out there in the truck, and it's all loaded up, and we pray for everybody here on the ground comes and helps, and we're getting faster and faster. We're getting it done faster and faster, and I praise God for all the helpers here. We get out there, and we all go out there, and we we lay hands on that truckload of magazines and, and maybe, I don't know, how many bags, 80 bags or something. And, and we lay our hands on and we pray for every mailman that's going to be touching those bags. And we, we this last time we started to pray, and all of you intercessors can help us pray, that people more people will respond to the magazine. Somebody called me not too long ago and, and they said they'd gotten that magazine for years and threw it away. Didn't even look at it. And one day they picked it up and read it and they just were on cloud nine and they phoned from California. And we get many, many beautiful letters, and then we get a few bad letters, you know, reading us out, telling us how imbalanced we are and how stupid we are and all of that. But praise God, we can sure rise above all that. And one man who is a prophet, who says he's a prophet, he wrote us a letter not too long ago, and he, he said, you're the most unbalanced people I've ever read after. And I said, well, praise the Lord. And it wasn't, it wasn't too long after that that we get a letter from another prophet wanting to raise $30,000 because that man's hip had collapsed and he had to have a new hip socket. So, you know, it doesn't pay to come against God's anointed. You see, when you come against us, you don't come against us as a person. You come against God's anointed. Well, I said he was a pro He says he's a prophet. So he was walking around. You're pretty unbalanced when your hip goes out. <laughs> you see what I mean? And I bless that man tonight, and I pray to God that, that in some way he will be helped by the magazine. He didn't ask to be taken off the list. Now, some people do. They just hideously give us the right hand of fellowship. Get out, you know. I don't want this anymore. I can't stand that coming. I don't want the mailman to see what kind of mail you're putting out to me. But praise God for all of the wonderful people, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. And we try to answer all of them as best we can. It's we need lots more secretaries to help us if we answer everything. But people who write in for questions, prayer requests, uh, Patty and I and Glenn pray over them, and we bring them down here on Thursday. We pray over them, and we, we try to answer them. And, and I tell you, I would like to hear from all of you after you get back home and tell me just exactly what the Lord is still doing for you. Don't retreat one inch backwards. Advance against the enemy. Be bold against the enemy. And you'll be surprised how your your growth. There's people here that has grown miles since last Saturday night when they first came in in the first service. <laughs> I see her laughing. How many received the Holy Spirit this week? Or received a fresh 
Look at that. Look at that. A fresh anointing to pray in tongues. Look at that. Praise God. And how many people were healed this week? Praise God. You know, there's more happened here this week than happens in some churches in 10 years. And I praise God for that. And we're so glad for all you new ones that have just arrived. Uh, we're glad for Sister Lansman that arrived today on the plane. She had a hard trip coming in from New York, and she lives in El Paso. And, but anyway, she got here, and the people from Paducah got here today, and the people from West Monroe. And there's a, Oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch coming in from West Monroe tonight, and they'll be coming into the dormitory maybe late. So try to leave some kind of a light on up there so they can find their, a bed. And uh, Brother Parrish is, is going to come and speak to us. Now, Now tomorrow night is a watch night service. I don't know exactly what time we'll start it. I guess we'll announce in the afternoon what time the evening meeting will start. And about 10 o'clock, we're going to have refreshments. And any of you that can, bring dips and chips. And, and we'll have a time of fellowship. And then we'll come back uh, after a sermon. And then we'll come back. And, and we're going to have sweet communion with the Lord and, and uh, pray for the coming new year. The, the year 1983 has been just like a landslide here. It's been glorious. It has been glorious. I believe we paid off, what was it, 90-some thousand dollars on, on two notes. I mean, just actual paying off. Besides paying something like 1300 a month on, on uh, payments and all kinds. We got the doors in. We got the ceilings in, the fans in. All kinds of work done outside. Between ten and twelve thousand a month in operating. Yes, we have labor expenses and insurance is very high here, and utilities are terribly high, and they keep going up. Phone bills are high, and and we just praise God that He has blessed us like that. And I just was sitting here wondering, you know, what's 90, 1984 really going to be like? What's it really going to be like? And. I know it's going to be really something. I believe the presence of the Lord has been stronger here, this convention, than ever. Every time it seems we're building higher and higher. And that's what the Holy Spirit says in the book of Revelations. Come up higher. Come up higher. Don't retreat back down again next week and go back into your uh, terrible, you know, depression and all that. Rise up out of it. You can rise up out of it. Just begin praising God. And the devil will flee. He said... The Word of God says, submit to God. This is a recipe. Women understand recipes. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he's going to flee. And, and, and you can do that. Open your mouth and try it. You'll be surprised what happens. You really will. And I just love all of you, and I love these ministries, and they're going to have to leave tomorrow. We don't want them to go tomorrow. No, they're not all going. Oh, no, they're not all going. But, but Brother Holzhauser is going to go back home to pastor and, and see his wife and kids and 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 he's promised to come back in in June to the summer camp with brother uh, with brother Leroy Leroy from Toronto Canada and I don't know who else but praise God are uh, you pushing on me no yes and <laughs> leaning no. on me uh, she mentioned something that came up about the finances and how we live here month by month our income to cover all these expenses is just what the Lord lays on your hearts across the nation to take care of all this. And we really can't hardly believe what the Lord has done for us this past year. It's beyond what we... I, I asked for it, and the Lord, I asked that we could have this place cleared from bank in, encumbrance uh, by the end of the year. And the Lord has practically taken care of that. We, will have, we have one note that is carried by private people, there's very low rate of interest, and uh, I'm not concerned about that. It's on a small piece of land, the corner of the property over here on the other side. I'd like to pay it off, but the interest rate is very low on it. So, But uh, two months ago, eh, well, lots of times, Irm and Patty, they pay the bills, and they get preturbed, you know, like <laughs> Betty has to. And I, Irma can feel for you, Betty. And uh, Norman doesn't get upset about it, and I don't either. But two months ago, you know why? <laughs> yeah, they, they. Two months ago, why? They were paying the bills, and she was feeling very low and bad, you know. And where was the money going? We didn't have enough money to pay them, and she opened the check, a, an envelope, and it had fifty-one hundred dollars in it. So <laughs> then she had to repent a little bit and rejoice. 
<laughs> that was but, a good repentance and a good rejoicing. But that, that's what happens here continually, month by month. The Lord lays it on somebody's heart, or, or many hearts, and financial support comes in, and the Lord helps us to continue to grow and to build and to carry on and declare that He is Lord and that the kingdom is ours and we will possess the kingdom and put Satan underfoot. Amen. Now, Brother Norman Parrish, I'm going to tie this around his neck in a half a minute. I want to uh, say, first of all, that it's been a real joy and a real privilege to be here in Lake Hamilton this week. It's been a treat. We've been looking forward to this uh, time of uh, rest and also time of uh, refreshing. Uh, you know, living on the mission field, ministering on the mission field, we're always giving up. And we don't have the opportunity that you have just to flick on your television set and listen to Christian television all day long and all night long. And, but we don't have that privilege. We're always ministering. And uh, I usually look forward to these conferences, these workshops, to sit and listen. I really enjoyed Brother Charlie's and Brother Bob's ministry this week. It's been a source of inspiration. And I've made an effort to be in every service just to listen, just to uh, receive what the Lord has in store for us as much as for you. Uh, let me just say that I really love uh, Irma and, and Glenn. Uh, I learned to love them the very first day that I met them. Uh, they didn't seem like strangers then, and they certainly don't seem like strangers now. Uh, from the first moment, I felt a kindred spirit, just a rapport, you know, just that, that unity in the spirit that we have with a few people around the country. Uh, I appreciate them. I appreciate what they stand for. I appreciate what they are doing here and and also in other parts of the country and the world. Uh, they have adopted us as their missionaries. And as Brother Glenn stated last night, uh, nearly on a regular basis, monthly, uh, we receive a check, a substantial check from Lake Hamilton. I know that it represents uh, sometimes a real sacrifice because uh, the overhead here is, uh, like you already mentioned tonight, is something uh, that can be a little frightening to keep a camp like this going with all the staff and but uh, every month they set aside a certain amount of money uh, to send it down to the mission field. And we take it and use it carefully. We invest it in the work. Uh, we're, we're faith missionaries. We're not connected with any denomination. We don't have the backing of any uh, denominational group. Uh, we don't have one and we don't want one. Uh, we just re we just were supported. Our ministry, our reach, outreach is supported by free will gifts of people here and there all over the country. And one of the things we've discovered is that deliverance people are generous people. Why? Because you've been delivered from stinginess. You've been delivered from uh, covetousness. Uh, really, uh, the, our best givers are people that are involved in the deliverance ministry. They give wholeheartedly. And we want to bless you, and we want to thank you, and we want, uh, we want to pray, we pray that God will reward you mightily for what you have done. Uh, we need you. We need your prayers. We need your gifts. We need your letters. We need the kind of backing that you can afford. Uh, uh, if you want to contribute to our ministry, you can send it right here through the Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. We trust the Millers. Uh, we know that they are trustworthy. And anything you designate and anything you send for the parishes will reach us, I know, of a certainty. So we're try to remember us. We have an extensive work. I, I, one of the hardest things I, I have to do when I come to the United States is report on our work. Every time I talk about the work, I feel that like I'm bragging. And I really don't want to do that. Because anything that's been accomplished through our ministry in these 30 years that we've been in actual missionary work in Latin America has been by God's grace and by God's power. We give him the glory. But it would take you weeks, it would take you months to come and visit the work. You know, go from one area to another area, one church to another church. We work all the way from Mexico into Colombia and South America. And it, uh, I'm away from home about six months of the year. And as I said the first night I was here, many times my family complains, and I can't blame them. But I feel uh, an urgency. You know, Central America is a trouble spot. Uh, Central America is in the sight of communism, the international communists. They... Communism is determined to take Central America over, to establish a socialistic, communistic states in Central America. And I feel the urgency to minister in these countries, in these areas now, while there's still an op open door, while there's still an opportunity. 
And that's why I, as soon as I get back to Guatemala next Friday or Saturday, uh, I'll be leaving for Colombia and South America. I'll only be in Guatemala for five days, and then I'll fly on to Colombia uh, for a pastor's uh, convention, for a, a youth uh, camp. Because uh, I feel that uh, we have to take opportunity, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that perhaps will never return. So you back us with your prayers. Uh, hold us up before the throne of grace. Uh, I hope that you'll feel a burden and feel a, a challenge. Uh, get involved in mission. Uh, Spirit-filled people, especially those that have been in, know something about kingdom teaching or sonship teaching or deliverance teaching, should be the most missionary-minded people in the world. Amen? And yet it's pitiful to find whole churches and whole groups that claim to be, be in the end-time teaching that are completely oblivious of the fact that there are people out there, millions upon millions upon millions, that have never heard the gospel even once. They sit around in their little bless me parties, <laughs> building themselves up in the most holy faith. Uh, yes, being stuffed, not fed, but stuffed with all kinds of good teaching while people out there have never heard. That's cruel. That's selfish. So do something about it. Get involved. Become a prayer warrior. Become a supporter. Uh, become a collaborator. Do something. Whatever the Lord lays upon your heart to do for those that are involved in missionary work. Let's open our Bibles tonight in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're going to read the first 14 verses. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market or gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that condition, he saith unto him, Will thou be made whole? Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed, and walk. Then asked they, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who, he was, who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said, said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. This is a beautiful passage. I'm sure you've read it. I'm sure you've studied it. I'm sure you've heard many, many messages based upon this passage of Scripture. I've at least preached five or six different sermons based upon this passage of Scripture. It's so rich. It's so full. Uh, if you just read it at one sitting, you might think it's just a quaint historical event. It's just uh, one of the many incidents uh, taken out of the ministry of Christ. A miracle, a healing, something uh, supernatural. But really, brothers, this passage has great symbolic spiritual meaning. Amen? It has a wealth of teaching. And I trust and pray that the Spirit of God will open it up to you. Before we really get into my subject, I would like to say that this passage proves unmistakably that you can experience God's power in healing and deliverance and still never get to know the Lord as He would want you to know Him. This man received a tremendous miracle. He was healed. He was restored. After suffering this uh, incurable disease for 38 years, he was healed by the power of God. And when son, the, the leaders of the Jews, the rulers, stopped him to ask him why was he uh, walking and carrying his bed on a Sabbath day, they, he said, the, the man that healed me, he told me to do this. And they said, who, who was that man that told you to carry your bed? on the Sabbath, and he, he said, I don't know. 
And isn't that true of us, of many of the 20th century Christians? Uh, that we experience the power of God in, in the most unusual ways. Sometimes we're saved, sometimes we're healed, sometimes we're delivered. And yet we don't know the Lord as we should know Him. We don't know Him in all His grandeur, in all His beauty. And really the purpose of the gospel is that we might know Him, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen? Know Him in His reality. And brethren, don't be satisfied just by uh, experiencing deliverance or healing or restoration by the power of God. Your aim, your goal should be to know the Lord. Right? Amen? To know Him in the beauty of His holiness. Uh, don't don't uh, be shortchanged. And decide for yourself that in 1984 you're going to really get personally and intimately acquainted with the Lord. Amen? You're going to establish a relationship with the Lord. See, it's not enough to, to experience His grace or His power. You've got to know Him as He is. Okay? Now, the, the subject I'm going to deal with tonight is can be found there in verse chapter 6. Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? We're going to talk about the will. You know, in the body of Christ, there's been a great emphasis, for example, on feeling. The Pentecostal, the holiness people, have given undue emphasis on feelings. They play, they harp upon the emotions of men and women. Can you feel the glory? Can you feel the power? Can you really feel the presence of God? You know, our emotions are very fickle. Our emotions betray us. We can be up in the clouds one moment, and then we can be down in the dump the next moment. Amen? like a titter-totter. Many times spiritually we're like in an elevator, up and down, up and down, up and down. We never get stabilized in our Christian life because we depend upon our emotions. Brother, I've gone for months for you uh, at end without realizing or without perceiving the conscious presence of God in my life. God has not withdrawn His presence. He withdrawn the consciousness of His presence. I know He's there. I know He's there because the Word says He's there. But I don't feel any oozy feelings. I don't feel any tingling sensations. Uh, I know the Lord is with me because He promised to be with me. And that's enough. Though I'm with you always. And that word always means there at all times, in all places. The Lord is present whether we feel Him or not. Amen? But we've fallen into a rut. We want to feel something. And, if, and unless we feel that, we begin to get depressed. We let the devil get us down in the dumps. And he stomps on us when we depend upon our sensations, on our feelings, on our emotions. There's been a tremendous emphasis in the body of Christ on faith. No, the last two, three years has seen a phenomenon all through the United States, what we call the faith movement. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches have suddenly sprung up all over the United States uh, on, based on that new faith teaching. They're called faith churches, word of faith churches. And uh, I'm not going to say the teaching's wrong. I think it is a little bit out of balance. It's not properly balanced with other important subjects of the Scripture. But brethren, there's something more important than feeling. There's something more important than faith, and that is the will. Let me tell you something, brethren. I have seldom, if ever, heard a message on the will, on the importance of the will, in succeeding, in living a victorious life. Amen? Amen. And yet, if we study the Word, we'll discover that the secret of real success in our Christian life is not what we believe, not what we feel, but what we choose in relation to the will of God as it is revealed in Holy Scripture. Amen? Will thou be made whole? Now, the, the Scripture tells us that uh, Jesus was in Jerusalem. This was one of his first ventures into Jerusalem after he'd been baptized in water and baptized in the Spirit. He came to Jerusalem because there was a feast day. It doesn't say if it was... Passover or Pentecost, it just says that it was feast day. And it was his custom, and not only his custom, but his obligation 
to go to Jerusalem, all Jewish men, all every Israelite of age had to go to Jerusalem how many times a year? Three times. For Passover, for Pentecost, for Tabernacle. And he had to come up and appear before the Lord. <laughs> uh, how would we say? Not empty-handed. He had to bring something, a present, an offering. It was an act of devotion. It was an act of obedience. And Jesus, as a devout Jew, he came to fulfill the law and not to abolish the law, uh, went up to Jerusalem. And as he was wandering through the city, probably sightseeing, he was human after all, <laughs> uh, he, he walked through the city, let's say aimlessly, he arrived at a place called Bethesda. This was one of many pools that had been built by one of the famous old kings called Hezekiah. And Hezekiah built one of the marvels of ancient engineering. He had built one of the first portable water systems in the world. He had introduced portable water to Jerusalem so that Jerusalem would never lack water, no matter how dry the season might be. He had built canals. He had built uh, uh, pools. The, these pools were reservoirs. Reservoirs. Uh, these pools were uh, places where water was stored up for those month, months of drought. People came there to bathe. People came there to wash. People came there to fetch enough water for their household needs. Now, one of these pools in particular, the Bible talks about another in, uh, in uh, John chapter 9. It's, uh, Jesus told the blind man to go to the pool of what? What's the name? Silo. Uh, so, every one of these pools had a particular name. Now, this pool of Bethesda had become something like a shrine. Miraculous occurrences took place there. From time to time, the Bible says that an angel of God came and saturated the waters of that pool with God's healing power. Uh, the angel came and stirred these waters and saturated these waters with God's mighty healing power. So around this pool, people gathered every day. The Bible says the blind, the lame, the halt. Hundreds of people with all kinds of physical infirmities and disabilities. And they came and they waited patiently for the moving of the water. And as soon as the water began to like a whirlpool would be formed in the water, they would rush at one accord, and they would plunge into the pool. They would jump in head first. And the Bible says that the first person that landed in the water was healed of what? Of any infirmity. No matter how chronic, no matter how grievous, of any infirmity that he had. So people were constantly being healed there. The Bible doesn't, doesn't say that this was a daily or a weekly or monthly occurrence. It happened frequently. Now, there was one man in particular that had been coming there week after week, month after month, year after year. For 38 years, this man had been afflicted by what then was an incurable disease. This disease was disabling. The man couldn't move freely. Properly, he couldn't... Stand, he couldn't walk. All he could do was crawl. With great difficulty, he could crawl. And the Bible says that when the moving of the water took place, the angel of God, the Spirit of God, came and saturated these waters with the healing power of God. This man made an effort. He always made an effort. He didn't sit by passively. He wasn't an observer. He wasn't a spectator. He tried to be involved in this manifestation of the power of God. He... He dragged himself towards the pool, but sad to say, he always arrived too late. Others that were uh, quicker, nimbler, were able to arrive, were able to jump before he could. And so it was one disappointment after another disappointment. One frustration after another frustration. He saw probably hundreds of people being healed before his own eyes as God in his power and mercy visited his people there at the pool of Bethesda. But one thing is true, brethren. This man never left, lost heart, uh, hope. He never lost hope. There was an expectation. I believe there was a determination. Uh, when Jesus walked in that pool that day, he saw hundreds of people sitting around, lying around, waiting. 
And yet, he was directed by the Holy Spirit to just one man. I've heard some preachers say that if Jesus came back to earth, he would, he would empty the hospitals. He would go into some of these general hospitals, these city hospitals, and he'd empty them. I don't believe that's true. God, Jesus was very selective in his healing ministry. Amen? Not everybody who was possessed was delivered in Jesus' time. Not everybody that was sick was healed in Jesus' time. People had to meet certain conditions or requirements before they could experience experience God's mighty power. There's something this man attracted Jesus. He was drawn to him like, by, uh, like a magnet. He walked up to him and immediately he asked him a question that at first sight would seem so foolish, so unnecessary. Wilt thou be made whole? The man could have been offended. He said, why... Uh, that's what I'm here for. That's why I've been coming here for year, year after year. It was obvious. Just the fact that he was there would prove that he was waiting and hoping for healing someday. Will thou be made whole? See, but brethren, this question has a, has a tremendous meaning because it reveals the importance of the will in uh, healing and in restoration. Amen. See, when God created us, He created us with a little funny little mechanism called free will. We're not robots that can, that can be programmed. We're not pu puppets that can be manipulated. We are free agents. God created us in His likeness. He gave us the ability, the right to what? To choose between right and wrong, between good and evil. We can decide for ourselves Listen to this, the very course of our life. In a certain sense, and don't be shocked by what I'm going to say, in a certain sense, we are masters of our own destiny. Not only can we choose the direction of our life for time, but also for eternity. Amen? See, we have a will of our own that we can incline in one direction or the other. And sad to say, most of us... <laughs> One or another time in life had made wrong choices. That's why we failed in marriage. That's why we failed in business. That's why we made fools of ourselves. Amen? That's why we have to lament, in many cases, things that happened back 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. We, we made a wrong decision. We didn't wait. We didn't tarry. We didn't seek God's faith. Well, maybe... Uh, back then, we didn't even know the Lord. We weren't saved. And so we made mistakes. We committed errors that are having uh, a telling effect upon our life even to this day. Isn't that true? But see, brethren, the will is one of the most important factors in life. And we should know that. Uh, we shouldn't go by our feelings, but we should go by our w choices. Uh, the intents of the heart, the choices of the heart are perhaps the most important thing in life. As long as you're depending upon feelings, emotions, sensations, you'll be unstable both emotionally and spiritually. But when you set your will in the right direction, when you lock your will in, then, brother, you can, we can say nearly glide through life. Amen? You rise above your circumstances. You won't let this, your circumstances affect you. You won't let the circumstances hurt you. Because you are determined, with God's help, that you're going to come out on top of every circumstance, no matter how adverse and how devastating it might be. Amen? Now, the Bible shows us, brethren, that we are free agents. And someone here just re uh, this week said that God is a gentleman. And I've always said that. Because God will not force entry. He will not uh, coerce us. He will not obligate us to be or to do anything that we refuse to do. Amen? Are you with me tonight? It's mighty quiet tonight. Uh, you're not responding. <laughs> you're not reacting. Uh, probably you're uh, afraid that I'm going to head off in the wrong direction. But it, 
Brethren, see, there's, there's been for years that same controversy that I mentioned before between the Armenians and the, and the Calvinists. The Armenians have all overly emphasized the free will of man and the Calvinists have overemphasized the sovereignty of God. Both things are right. The problem with us is we don't know how to interrelate them. We don't know how they tally. And so we tend to accept one and reject the other. Uh, but really, brethren, we are free agents. God has given us the right to choose. And it's very important that we learn to choose that which God would want us to choose. Amen? Well, now, one of the principles of the kingdom of God, and we're going to see that immediately, is that we must decide for ourselves what we're going to have, what we're going to do, and what we're going to be. Amen? God's not going to force His blessings upon us. He wants to save us, but He can't save us until we want to be saved. He wants to deliver us, but we cannot be delivered until we want to be delivered. That's why I refuse to minister anybody that doesn't ask for ministry. There's a lot of well-meaning people that come up to me and say, Brother Parrish, will you pray for my husband? Will you pray for my daughter? And I say, yes, if they ask me to. See? Because if they don't ask, I'm going to waste my breath and waste my time. Because that person is not willing to let the Holy Spirit invade their lives and deal with their sins, and deal with their demons, and deal with their illnesses. Perhaps, perhaps they're just happy to be just like they are. Uh, perhaps they're, they're in such a state of stupor that they don't know how bad they are. And perhaps they've lived with their demons all their life so that they, they don't realize that they, there's anything wrong with them. The demons have blended with them. The demons have identified with them. Uh, the demons, the demonic personality has, has uh, been integrated with the human personality. And so, unless they want to be delivered and ask to be delivered, you're wasting your time, your valuable time trying to minister to somebody that either doesn't know or doesn't want to be healed by the, or delivered by the power of God. Amen? I remember some years back, uh, there, in Guatemala, there was a very uh, famous pastor. He was the pastor of the biggest church in Guatemala at the time. The church had about 1,500 members. And it was renowned. It was, uh, it was famous throughout of Central America. That was back in the early 40s, in the middle 40s, when you know the work of God in, in Guatemala and Central America was really just getting started. Now, this man uh, uh, was not spirit-filled. He didn't know anything about the infilling of the Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, probably he opposed it. Probably he attacked it. And uh, anyway, uh, this man uh, one day decided to uh, suspend from the consistory or from, from the board one of the deacons because of some minor uh, problem that had arisen in the church. He took it upon himself to put this man on probation. <laughs> well, the wife of this deacon... Uh, believed in sorcery, believed in witchcraft, and she went to a witch doctor and paid, I think it was $35, and put a curse on this man. Now, this curse was to wreck his marriage and wreck his ministry. And it had such an effect on this man that within two or three years, this man was a drunkard. Uh, he, he, his home was, was torn up, his ministry was uh, torn up, and the man was out of the street, sleeping in the gutter, a drunkard. A man that had been so successful, apparently, in Christian ministry. Well, he, he went for years. I would see him walking through the streets, smoking and drinking. And one day, uh, some of his relatives came to us. When we came into not only the baptism, but into the deliverance ministry, they came to me and said, Brother Parrish, if we bring this man, and his name was Jose Cordon, uh, will you pray for him? Well, I said, yes. And so one morning, they brought him, <laughs> but they brought him, unawares. I mean, he didn't know where he was going and he didn't know what he was going for. And they, they took him under false pretext. Under a false pretext. And when he discovered where he was and what they were trying to do with him, boy, he was incensed. He was furious. And the, the, his relatives wanted us to lock him up in a room. <laughs> Throw the key away. Have him there for two or three days on a forced fast. They thought that, well, that would work. And I said, 
I said, uh, brother, I said, Brother Jose, I, you, I, I, I recognize that you're a, a man, a mature man, uh, even a, a Christian man, although he was backslidden. And I say, well, anyways, we, we got into kind of a discussion, and he said, uh, when I tried to make him, confront him with his situation, I tried to make him realize how, you know, he was destroying himself, morally, spiritually, physically. Finally, he said, Brother Parrish, if you let me out of here, I'll come back on my own volition. And he kept his word. And let me tell you, he had a glorious deliverance. He's back in the ministry. He's pastoring a Baptist church. Uh, his ministry was salvaged. His home was not salvaged, but his ministry was salvaged. That's what deliverance does. But see, he, deliverance could not be forced on him. Amen? He had to be willing and ready and even anxious to be delivered. He had to, he had to cooperate in his deliverance. Because, see, brethren, there's a principle that cannot be violated... And that principle is that God has given us a will and we must exercise our will. Amen? We must exercise our will. The, the enemy would try to get us in a passive state. How many of you have gone through a passive state? Huh? Passivity is not of God. Huh? Passivity can be very dangerous. See, one, a passive state is... is uh, state that would induce even hypnosis. See, a person that's going to go through hypnosis just lets himself go. Let his mind go. Let his mind wander until it's taken over by a higher power. Amen? Amen. Now, God wants us to exercise our will, use our will to make the right kind of choices and the right kind of decisions. Let me show you from the word here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Are you interested in this subject? Amen. Here in John chapter 6, we have one of the miracles that you've heard about uh, through, object, through object lessons and through sermons. It's the feeding of the 5,000. How many remember that there was a multitude of people that came to listen eagerly to Jesus Christ? And they were so wrapped up in his teachings that they even forgot to what? To eat. They were there for three days. Maybe they had made provision for a day or for two, but... When the third day came and Jesus is uh, going to finalize that series of uh, teachings or messages, he wanted to send them away. He wanted to send them home. But he said, we can't send them home in, the, in this condition. If they go away without any food in their tummies, they're going to faint. They're going to fall by the wayside. So he, he called his disciples and said, give ye them to eat. And we, we know the, the, how the miracle took place because... A little boy in the crowd offered Jesus Christ his lunch. He was perhaps the only one present that had anything to eat. He had five loaves, he had two fishes. And Jesus took, blessed, break, distributed. Now, let's notice the principle that guided Jesus. Here it says in uh, John chapter 6, John chapter 6 verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, both the loaves and the fishes, as much as they would. As much as they would. There's the will in action. Jesus was giving every person present, young or old, man or woman, the right to decide how much or how little they were going to eat. Jesus made the bread, the loaves, the fishes available to the multitude. He invited them to eat. But if somebody said... I don't like that. Too bad. They'd start. Because Jesus wasn't going to sick Peter or, or James or John on them to go and sit on them and, and forcibly feed them. He wasn't going to put a tube down their throat and feed them like uh, they're trying to feed a, a, a lady out in, out in California that is a quad, quadriplegic and she doesn't want to live. And the state has taken upon itself the responsibility of keeping her alive. And, and no hospital was, wants to entertain her. And nurses and others are trying to, uh, you know, uh, get away from the job of feeding that girl. Because I imagine it's quite a fight every time they try to feed her. She doesn't want to eat. She doesn't want to live. And yet, the state is forcing this woman to live in such a miserable condition. 
in which he is in. Now, Jesus would never use those tactics. He said, he said to his disciples, place the, the loaves, the fishes at their disposal, but let every one decide for himself what he's going to eat. What he's going to eat. How much? How little? Amen? See, that's the principle in the kingdom of God. Principle in the kingdom. Let's look at, we can see it back here in the book of Esther also. Book of Esther. The book of Esther is, is full of teaching, brethren. It's not just a nice little story about a king and a queen. In fact, in, in figure, in type, the, all the end time program of God can be found in the book of Esther. Now, it says here that there was a king. He was a Persian king that came into power and he, he set out to conquer the whole known world, the whole populated world. And within months, he was able to establish his authority, his dominion, over 107, let me see, 107 and 20 provinces, 127 different provinces. So when he had consolidated his rule, he decided to have a feast. Now this feast had two parts. The first one he was going to, he called all his princes and all his governors, and they had a seven day banquet. Uh, all royalty was there. The people that, that, that were in positions of authority all through the kingdom were invited to this first banquet. Then after that, he decided to have a banquet for all the people that lived in the capital city in Shushan. We can see it here, brethren, in verse 5. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people. I believe these two feasts, the first feast and, and the second feast, represent the two outpourings of the Spirit of God. The outpouring at the beginning of this dispensation and the outpouring at the end of this dispensation. See, the outpouring at Pentecost was really limited. It was, <laughs> God poured out His Spirit only upon 120 people. But at the end of this dispensation, the Bible says that God will pour out His, flesh, His Spirit on what? All flesh. Okay, now they had this second feast, the second banquet, and the king established a rule. We can see it here in verse uh, 7. And they gave them to drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being d diverse one from another, and royal wine. What does wine represent in the Bible? It represents the Holy Spirit. The new wine represents the Spirit, particularly in it is that exuberant, exhilarating manifestation, joy, the joy of the Lord, as it is flows through our life by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now notice the, verse 8. And the drinking was according to the law. What was the law? None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure and according to every man's will. No one was going to be forced to drink of that royal wine. It was the wine that the king himself imbibed. It was the best wine. It was the most exquisite wine. It was the wine that had been stored for years in the king's vault. That's involved. <laughs> and really, it was, going to, it was going to be a privilege for the populace, you know, the, the common folk of the kingdom, to be able to drink of the royal wine. But he said, don't compel, don't curse, don't force anybody. Do according to every man's privilege, uh, pleasure. And brother, let me tell you, that's a rule in the kingdom of God. God never violates that rule. It's been established for eternity. Amen? Do you want to be saved? You have to want to. I mean, you want healing? You have to want to. Deliverance? You have to want to. Infilling the Holy Spirit? You have to want to. All depends on your will. Amen? Now let's look into this tonight. Are you still interested? Yeah. Not I can cancel my message or change my message. <laughs> First of all, salvation is a matter of free will. Salvation is a matter of free will. I hope there's not too many Calvinists here tonight. <coughs> They might throw me some bats and some bricks. But really, listen to this. Does God want to save us? Does He only want to save a few? Are there privileged ones or preferred ones? Does God play favorites? God is no respecter of persons. He's made salvation available to the whole human race. Christ's death at Calvary was sufficient to save every human being that has lived on the face of the earth. From Pentecost on, billions upon billions of human beings were included in the plan of salvation. Now, how do we know that? Let's look at it right here in First uh, Timothy chapter 2. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who will, there's the will of God manifested, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. What does God want? He wants to save the whole human race. Did you know that God didn't create hell for mankind? And do you know that God never sends anybody to hell? <laughs> Man chooses to go to hell. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. If you, if you end up in hell, it's because you want to. Huh? Not because God wants to. God wants to forgive you. God wants to save you. God wants to uh, transform you. God wants to make you a per participant of uh, eternal life. But it depends on you. And, and the same problem here in America is people have heard the message over and over and over again and they've hardened their heart against God. Amen? Amen. No fear. Yeah. They've hardened their heart because they want to go their own way. They want to do their own thing. Uh, they, want, they want to live a selfish life. Amen? Now let's look at another passage quickly. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, the promise of his second coming as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, on the basis of, of Scripture, Paul, Peter, by revelation of the Spirit, state that God wants to save every man. God's will is that all come to repentance, all come to knowledge of the truth. Amen? God has made provision. Salvation is available to the human race. Really, we as evangelists, as missionaries, all we're doing is making God's will known to men and women everywhere. Uh, we're living in, in, uh, in a time in history when God is favorably disposed to the human race. Amen? This is an acceptable time. This is a time when God is willing to accept anybody, anyhow. Amen? But God wants each and every man to decide for himself. You know, if people were forced into heaven, they'd be the most miserable <laughs> people in the world. Heaven would be turned into hell. If one person was forced to go to heaven against his will, that person would, would make it miserable, not for, only for himself, but for everybody else. Hmm? That's why God has determined from the foundation of earth that every man, woman, boy, and girl has to decide for himself whether he wants to be saved or not. Amen? This is found even in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 1820, uh, Ezekiel 1832. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. Amen? God does not have any pleasure. He gets, he has no delight in the death of him that dieth. God's will is to forgive. God's will is to save. Matthew 18, 14. And I'm just giving you these scriptures so you can jot them down. You can read them. You can study it for yourself. Matthew 18, 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't want even a small child to perish. No matter how small, no matter how insignificant the human being might be, God wants to save that man. Amen? Now, is God's will going to be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven? I believe there will be more people in heaven than in hell. It doesn't seem to be like that if we, if we, if we try to reason it out. Uh, if we look around America, we look ar around the world tonight, we're seeing that maybe uh, a very small percentage of the of people living on the face of the earth today have uh, made a decision for Jesus Christ. Maybe one out of ten. It would seem to be that 90% of the people are going to hell and 10% of the people are going to heaven. But let me tell you something, brethren. I don't know how God's going to do it. It's a mystery to me. But I believe there will be more people in heaven than there will be in hell. God's not, going to be God's not going to lose out. Amen? Now, what is, going, what, what is it going to take? I don't know. I'm not even going to try to figure it out. Um, we, there's some theories around there about second chance, about reincarnation, uh, about purgatory. Uh, a lot of things that, 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 would, that have been invented by man trying to uh, help God salvage the human race. Now... One thing is certain, though, that I believe that God is going to come out on top. Amen. He that laughs, 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 laughs best. Huh? And what does Psalm 2 say? Uh, God's going to have the last laugh. Amen? He's going to laugh up his sleeve. 
Uh, he's going to deride Satan. He's going to mock Satan. He's going to scoff Satan. He's going to jeer Satan. Uh, Satan thinks he's uh, winning the battle. But who's going to be victorious? Who's going to be triumphant? Hallelujah. How many believe that? Amen. Now let's go to John chapter 5 verse 40. This verse here proves unmistakably that salvation is a matter of free choice. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. Friday evening, December the 30th, 1983, Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker of the evening. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. That salvation is a matter of free choice. I think this verse is one of the saddest of Scripture. It's short, but it's sad. What does it say? John 5, uh, 540. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Ye will not. You don't come because you don't want to come. Amen. Jesus calls. Jesus invites. Jesus appeals. Jesus opens the gates of heaven. <laughs> but men will not. Will not come. Why? Because they're stubborn. They're obstinate. They're rebellious. Huh? The Bible calls them stiff necked Because they won't bow. They won't surrender. They will not submit their will to the will of God. Amen? And that's why people go to hell. I'm going to talk a little later on tonight, if I have time, <laughs> about rebellion and the consequences of rebellion. Because there's some people here tonight that have, are classic rebels. And, and I want to warn you. I believe that God's Word abides forever. And I believe what the Word of God says is eternally true. And you're not going to be able to, to uh, kick against the, what is this, against the prick without suffering the consequences. Amen? You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to destroy yourself if you try to set your will against the will of God. Huh? But you willingly, voluntarily have to surrender your will to the will of God. You have to lay your will alongside the will of God. You have to do what Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Now, we know that God wants to save us. Isn't that true? But he cannot save us until we are willing to be saved. Okay? Isn't that something that God has limited himself? God has limited himself. I, God grieves. God weeps over the human race. There's such an urging. There's such a yearning in the heart of God to save every human being. He created them. Amen? Does God love? Does God care? God's not an ogre. He didn't create man to destroy them. But sad to say... <laughs> If you violate the principles that God established in the world, in His Word, you're going to suffer the consequences. Some people think they're so smart, they can outsmart God. If you think you're that smart, you're just plumb stupid. <laughs> huh? You're just plumb stupid. Because, brethren, you can't outsmart God. What God has said has been established forever in heaven. It's, it's the foundation of His throne. And if He would permit His those principles to be violated with impunity, His throne would crumble. His throne would fall. God would cease being God. Amen. He's got to stand up to his own principles. What he has decreed shall come to pass. Amen. How many believe that? How many believe that? Okay. Okay. Salvation is a matter of free will. Are you convinced? Okay. Discipleship is a matter of free will. See, God's not going to force you to serve him. God is not going to force you to serve him. If you want to live your own life in pleasure, in business, you can. But you're going to be the loser. Amen? Amen? You're going to be the loser. Because let me tell you something. If you don't serve God, God hey, God's going to find somebody that will. Amen. And sometime in eternity, if you look back and you see all the wasted opportunities, you're going to lament. You're going to grieve. But it's too late. See? Discipleship is a matter of free will. Let's look at uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will... Whosoever will, come after me. Let him deny himself and make up, take up his cross and follow me. It says, whosoever will. 
God wants you to follow Him. God wants you to serve Him. But you have to decide where you think it's worthwhile. I've seen many young people that have wanted to offer themselves for Christian service to become a pastor or become a missionary and their parents stand in the way. How are you going to waste your life? See, they, parents are selfish. They want their children to be lawyers and doctors and engineers. They want their children to be wealthy so the children can take care of them in their old age. Come on now, isn't that true? For the most part. We want our children to succeed. We want to bask. We want to glow in the success of our children. We want to be proud of them. And who's going to be proud of somebody who goes and buries himself way down in South America or in South Africa becomes a missionary to the heathen? Why, that's the most stupid thing to do. You're throwing away your life. That's what they tell you. Amen? A lot of Christian parents discourage their children from serving God. See, because uh, they've got other plans for their children. They want to, to marry into a wealthy family and they want to, them to work into a, into a, uh, a favorable position in life. But brethren, I don't think there's any greater uh, privilege than serving God. Amen. Amen. To be a, a representative, to be an ambassador of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is the greater privilege, the greatest privilege any human being might have. And if God has called you to be a missionary, and this is, these were the exact words of one of the uh, or pioneer missionaries. If God has called you to be a missionary, don't lower yourself to become an ambassador of the United States huh? or a president of the United States. You think they're going to remember Jimmy Carter in eternity? Or Richard Nixon in eternity? Those duds? Huh? No. But let me tell you, some of the, some of the nobody, people that have never had their life story written up in books and magazines, men and women that have gone and given their lives for the gospel in some of these remote areas of the world, they'll be at the forefront in eternity. They'll occupy the first places. They'll be honored. Huh? when some of the great figures of history will be long forgotten. Thank goodness. Okay. Amen. Matthew sixteen twenty four. I'm going to have to rush a little bit. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There it is. Clearly established. If any man will, if any man will to come after me, then here are the steps he has to take. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But the important factor is the will. That's where it has to start. And if, you, if you're if you not only willing, but determined to serve God, you will make any effort, you will make any sacrifice that is necessary to become a servant of the Most High. Amen? You'll be willing to die to yourself. You'll be willing to give up family and, and uh, position. You'll be willing to give everything up in order to follow Jesus all the way. See, the elect are those, according to Revelation chapter 3, 14, that follow Jesus whithersoever he goeth. Amen? They're true disciples. They, the only choice they make is to, to follow the Lord wherever he leads by his Holy Spirit. Okay, we've seen that salvation is a matter of the will. Discipleship is a matter of will. Let's look at something else. Healing is a matter of the will. You know, there's a, a famous book that is widely read in most of the medical schools, most of the universities, and it's called The Will to Live. It's required reading because doctors have discovered that they have to have the cooperation of the patient. No matter how potent the medicine might be, no matter how recent the treatment might be, no matter what they might do for the patient, if the patient has, the patient has lost the will to live, the desire to live, there's nothing the doctor can do. He can be the greatest specialist in his field and he, he can't help that person because the person has willed himself to die. And he'll just wither away and die. So, in that book, uh, I, I'm told that uh, doctors, or prospective doctors, are instructed that they must not only get the cooperation of the patient, but of his relatives and friends and neighbors. They need people that will come and boost the morale of the patient. Build them up. Encourage him. Uh, if somebody is abandoned in a hospital or in an institution, what happens? The person loses hope. The person loses any desire to live. And no matter what the treatment, what the operation might be, it will fail because the man has lost the will. Amen? Now, you, ha you, you can will yourself back to health. Amen? We have a story here in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. How many have heard about Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus. In Mark 10, beginning verse 46. There's a blind man. Uh, this man, it seems to be, had lost his sight, maybe through an accident, through an, an illness. And then back then there was no welfare, so Bartimaeus had to do what everybody else did <laughs> under those conditions. He had to beg. 
So every day he would be take, taken by the hand to a, a strategic place in one of the main thoroughfares uh, in the outskirts of the city of Jericho. And he would sit there from sunup to sundown, begging in a pitiful voice, you know, asking for alms. And one day as he was sitting there, he heard a company, a great multitude coming. There was an air of excitement. He said, who is this? Maybe he's some rich ruler. Or he's, he's a potentate from one of those oriental countries, from Persia, from Arabia. So he thought, you know, this was an opportunity to get a good handout. And he began to inquire. He asked his fellow sufferers, who is it? Well, they said, it's just Jesus, that crazy prophet from Nazareth. <laughs> Jesus, he said. Well, I've heard about that man. How he's raised the dead. How he's cleansed the lepers. How he's delivered the oppressed. How he's uh, healed the sick. And he began to cry, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And what did his fellow sufferers say? Oh, you shut up. You're embarrassing us. Huh? Keep quiet. Keep still. Jesus isn't going to mind you. Well, you're nothing. You're, you're the scum of the earth. Huh? He's too busy. He's, he's too busy ministering to the high and up. But, but, uh, Bar Bartimaeus had something that most of us don't have. He had a, de a determination. He was determined to be healed. He was determined to take advantage of that perhaps first and only opportunity he had to be healed. Let me tell you, brethren, if Bartimaeus would have been dissuaded, would have been discouraged, he would have died blind. Jesus never again passed that way. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to be betrayed, to be crucified. Amen? So he cried out loudly, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the Bible says that Jesus stopped and sent someone to fetch him. Maybe one of his disciples walked up and said, Bartimaeus, take courage. Amen. Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. In verse 50, and he cast away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will that I what? That I should do unto you. What will? What do you want? What do you really want? Now, what did Bartimaeus want? Did he want a new cape? Did he want some kind of subsidy? Uh, some kind of monthly uh, income for him and his family. No, he had a lot of needs. Did he or not? Didn't he? But there was one thing that was uppermost in his mind. And what was that? To recover his sight. He wanted to be healed. He wanted to be restored. When Jesus said, what will? What will thou that I should do unto you? He immediately said, Lord, that I might see. See, there's the will. And brethren, let's not, don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that God's blessings are going to come any other way. There must be such a strong will that you'll, you'll insist, you'll insist until Jesus hears and answers your plea. Amen? Amen. Now, does God want to heal us? How do we know it? Well, how many have read 3 John 2? Beloved, I desire, I will, and God speaking by the Holy Spirit through his prophet, through his apostle, through John, he says what? I will that thou prosper in all things and be in good health. Let me tell you something, brother. God not, doesn't only want to heal, heal us. He wants to keep us healthy. Amen. One thing is healing. Another thing is health. And God wants to bring us into a place where we enjoy good health. No matter what's happening around us. No matter what plague. No matter what, what, uh, what do they call them here? Pestilences. Uh, sweep through the area. God can can keep us in good health. He wants to keep us in good health. He wants to enjoy us to enjoy the best of health. Huh? How many believe that? How many read Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 1? It says that when Jesus came down from the mount, after he had preached that very famous sermon, what's called the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he, he was entering a certain village when a leper came out. Now, you know, lepers were outcasts. They lived in, in isolated places. They had to forewarn everybody. Whenever they met somebody on the road, they had to say, unclean, unclean, unclean. They couldn't mingle. They couldn't have any direct relationship even with their family. But this leper was a little bit bold, a little bit brash. He came and met Jesus and he said, Lord, if thou wilt. What was he appealing to? To the will of God. If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. This man had a problem. He didn't doubt. God's power. He knew that God could do anything. That God could do the most difficult, the most impossible thing. Amen? Thou canst. But he, he had a, a doubt. He said, if thou wilt, thou canst. He was doubting not the power of God, but the will of God. Amen? 
If thou wilt, thou canst. And what did Jesus immediately say? Yes. Two little words. He said, I will. And I think that should settle once and for all. Amen? Now, this man was not what we would call today a believer or a Christian. And if God was, Jesus was willing to heal him, don't you think he's willing, more than willing to heal us? Isn't healing, isn't deliverance the bread of God's children? Haven't we a right to be healthy? Amen? Jesus even violated certain pr principles because, you know, uh, it was forbidden for anybody that was healthy to touch a leper. But Jesus went up and touched him, laid his hands up on him, and he said, I will. And immediately, this man's flesh was restored to its original condition. Amen? Now, is it God's will to heal us? Yes. yes. But we have to will it. We have to want it. I, I would even venture to say that if we're sick, it's because we want to be sick. I found people that want to be sick. Huh? That's how they get attention. I remember a man there in Guatemala City. He was a beggar. One of the main streets near the post office. He was sitting on the sidewalk. He had his pant leg rolled up. And there in the middle of his leg, there was a big open oozing sore. It, it was, there was pus and, and blood and water coming out of that sore. It was a sight for sore eyes. And there was mosquitoes. I mean, not mosquito flies. All around. I got, went up to that man when I saw that and I said, man, you better go into the house and get this treated. Gang Green can sit in. They're going to have to amputate that leg. He said, you think I'm crazy? <laughs> he says, I earn more begging just a half a day than I could earn working a full day. He says, I can make more in four hours begging right in this, in the, here in this place than I could earn working eight, ten, twelve hours at a back-breaking job. See, that was his livelihood. He was a professional beggar. I think that any time that, that sore began to heal up, he'd poke it with a stick. Huh? <laughs> Probably he'd mix some dirt in there. He'd try to, to huh? make, make this infection flare up. Amen? He didn't want to be healed. I find out, once I found an old granny. She was about 75, 80 years of age, and she always moaned and groaned about all her real or imaginary sicknesses. She would, just went from one sickness to another sickness. And I, you know, I got to know her quite well, and I began to suspect that many of her sicknesses were uh, just uh, not not really psychosomatic. Uh, they were more like a pretense. They were a fable. And one day I began to talk to her, and, uh, and she confided. She said, Brother Perry, I've discovered that if I'm well, everybody forgets me. Uh, but when I begin to complain about my health, oh, my heart, oh, my kidney, oh, my liver, and uh, if I begin to act like if I'm going to die overnight, then they all flock around. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, they come with candies and they come with flowers and they're, they're, and they're just so, so, so uh, concerned about me. Does she want to be healed? No. Well, because she, she knew that that's the only way she can influence and even control her family. Amen. You will be healed when you set your heart and mind in that direction. Amen. When you determine it, see, I'll tell you something, brethren. A liberated will, a sanctified will, is one of the most powerful forces on in the earth. Amen. I believe with all my heart you can be what you want to be, and you can have what you want to have, and you can do what you want to do with God's help. The power of God's available. Yes, stop copying out. Stop excusing yourself. Try to stop justifying your failure. If, you're, if you fail, it's because you want to fail. If you're miserable, it's because you want to be miserable. Don't glare back at me, please. <laughs> Don't blame your wife. Don't blame, blame your mother. Don't blame anybody for what you are. You are what you are because you want to be like that. Does that surprise you? Does that surprise you? Hallelujah. You want some more? Deliverance. Deliverance is a matter of the will. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. Here we have the story of a woman called the, Canaan, uh, the Canaanite, the Syrophoenician woman. She came to Jesus. What did she have? She had a demon-possessed daughter. What did she want? She wanted delivered for that girl. And she could just, just couldn't take it any longer. She had baby this child. She had uh, taken care of this child for years, and she was just at wit's end. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy upon me. Now, I've preached in several different fellowships a message on this passage that I call the trial of your faith. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've heard it on tape. It's a very important message. And uh, I said, this woman said, Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. She was harassed. She was tormented. 
This girl had no rest, no respite. And night and day she would wander through the house just like a caged lion. She was a bundle of nerves, restless, nervous. She was just hyper, just went around like a, a raging lion. And the mother just, she would just come to the place that she, she couldn't take it any longer. So she came to Jesus. And we know that Jesus put her through a set of tests. Uh, he tried her. He tried her faith. But finally after she came through with fine colors, because Jesus first ignored her and then rejected her and then even insulted her. He said, it's not neat to take the children's bed and throw it to the dog. He was saying, you're just a mangy dog. You're just a stray dog. And she said, oh Lord, it's true. She agreed with Jesus. Don't fight with God. Agree with God. <laughs> she said, it's true, Lord. I'm worthless. But uh, even dogs have rights. Even dogs can eat the crumbs off their master's table. Amen. And when Jesus saw such persistence, saw such humility, he said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. She didn't say she had great faith. In fact, she never did say she had faith. Those that go around boasting and bragging about their faith, they're the ones that have the least amount of faith possible. They never, their faith is never put, being put to the test. Huh? But Jesus, Jesus said, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto you as thou will. will. There it is. Be it unto you as thou will. She wanted deliverance. That's what she wanted. And she wouldn't, she would not be denied. She would not take no for an answer. She just pressed on and pressed in. Huh? She persisted. She was a pest. Huh? She nagged. She pestered until finally Jesus said, Be it unto thee as thou wilt. Amen? If you want deliverance for yourself or for some loved one, you're going to have to imitate this, this gal. Amen? You're going to just have to bombard the gates of heaven. Huh? Knock and knock and knock until uh, God opens and God answers. Amen? Be it unto thee as thou wilt. Now, does God want to deliver us? Well, there's too many passages, but let's read just here in Galatians. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to get into rebellion. Oh, I will, I will. Galatians 1, 4. Galatians 1, 4. It says that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God in our Father. What is the will of God in our Father? To deliver us. Deliver us out of this world system. He wanted to deliver us from sin. He wants to deliver us from uh, uh, the flesh, the world, the devil. He wants to set us free from all entanglements. He wants us to, he wants to enter into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. This is the will of God. See, when it comes to salvation, healing, deliverance, we have a legal basis. The Bible says that God wants to save us. God wants to heal us. God wants to deliver us. But He cannot do it until we want it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. God is, the Philippians, I think it's 2.13 says, that God is He that worketh in us. To what? To will and then to do, according to his good pleasure. Just open that uh, verse and, and, and underline that verse. It's very important. For it is God worketh in you by his Holy Spirit, both to will and to do of his own, own good pleasure. See, God has to quicken your will before he can do anything. Amen? Philippians 2.13. God worketh in you both first to will and then to do according to his good pleasure, according to his own will. Amen? God wants to quicken your will so that you will cooperate with God. So that you will will what God wills. Amen? That your will will be blended with the will of God. Amen? Amen. And this is one of the workings of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is given to us to begin to exert certain pressures upon our will so that we will voluntarily submit our will to the will of God. And when, I, when he, uh, the Holy Spirit is able to turn our will around, then... God will do exceedingly abundantly about anything that we ask or anything that we think. Amen. Amen. He will do anything and everything that we ask of Him once our will is set in the, wrong, in the right direction. Amen? Amen. How many can praise the Lord? Amen. We've seen salvation, discipleship, healing, deliverance. Let's see now uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him, let him come unto me and drink. What was he talking about? Well, the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? This spake he of the Holy Spirit, that them that believe would receive. If any man thirst, that, what is thirst? A desire, and a ve ve vehement desire, 
an overwhelming desire, a strong desire. If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink of the waters of life freely. Let him come and drink of me, uh, of me, uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come and quench your thirst. Amen? Will come and fill you and satisfy you. But you must want it with all your heart. Amen? Remember what David said in uh, Psalm 42? As the heart panteth after the waters, so what? For my soul thirst, thirst after thee. Uh, see, that's the will. Let's, how do we know? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20, the last chapter, 21, 22, excuse me, and verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Not, it's not, this is not uh, an invitation for, to Jesus Christ to return. It's actually an invitation to the human race. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. Now notice this. And whosoever will, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Amen. When and how will you take of the water of life freely? When you will. Okay. Let me say something tonight that might shock a few of you. Is that if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, it's because you haven't wanted it bad enough. There's a lot of people that go through their Christian life. Uh, empty, forlorn. They don't find any satisfaction. And they'll go to meeting after meeting, convention after convention. They, they, they know the doctrine of the Spirit inside out. They know all about the gifts and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But they have never received that experience. They've never been baptized. They've never been filled. They've never been anointed. And why? Because they've never wanted it bad enough. Amen? Does God want to fill you with His Holy Ghost? Yeah. Is it God's will that you be Filled with the Spirit? How do we know? The Word of God. Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians quickly. Huh? Ephesians. Are you still with me tonight? <laughs> Whenever you get tired, just begin to do like that and I'll cut it short. Amen? Amen? Let's say, see what Philippians has to say, I mean Ephesians has to say here. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 17 and verse 18. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, the verse, verse 18, reveals what the will of God is. And be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is success, but be filled with the Spirit. What is God's will? That you and I be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled there is in a present progressive tense. It means that you be filled and filled and filled. You're constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not an experience, it's a, it's a state in which you live. Right. Now, God wants you to be filled. And if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not God's fault. Huh? Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not worthy. Oh, that's all baloney, brother. And those are all arguments that Satan will place in your mind to justify your spiritual dearth. See? God wants every child of God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in order for you to be filled, you must thirst. Uh, a thirst must be awakened within you. You must thirst. And that word thirst means desire. Strong desire. If It says, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life free. Amen? See, everything in our Christian life and experience is based upon our will. Amen? How many believe that tonight? I think we still have a few Calvinists. <laughs> you still hold on to that old denominational spirit. Uh, see, that some of these teachers have been ingrained. Well, we've been actually brainwashed in our churches to believe things that are not entirely true. Right. Amen? And, and there's an unlearning process. <laughs> and sometimes it takes many, many years for us to unlearn what we learned back in our, uh, some of our traditional churches. But let me tell you, brethren, I'm convinced that everything experienced in Christian life, from salvation to ministry to healing to deliverance to prosperity to revelation, anything and everything depends on us. See, what God was going to do for us, He's already done it. Huh? It's already done. God has given us all things in Christ. Doesn't, that, doesn't the Bible say that? Amen. When he gave, he gave Christ, he gave all. <laughs> when he gave Christ, he gave the best he had. The Bible says that if he didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us so that he, we could be redeemed, how much more he will give, what? Freely, abundantly, 
All things. All things are ours. Doesn't that, doesn't Paul say that? Amen? Amen? It says right here in 1 Corinthians, and just mark that, ver uh, that verse, and claim that verse. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 21 and verse 22, it says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are ours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. They're already ours. We can have them. They're ours for the asking. Better still, they're ours for the willing. You determine to come into everything that God has provided for you. Amen? Amen. It's your choice. See, we, we are constantly faced with choices. The choices are between heaven and hell, life and death. Even in the Old Testament, people were challenged. Even in the Old Testament, people were brought to a place where they had to make a decision. Didn't Moses tell the people of Israel that they had to decide? Amen? Let's go to Deuteronomy 30, 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to re rec record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Brother Glenn was mentioning this passage. Therefore, choose, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose. See? God is setting before us heaven and hell, life and death, blessing and cursing. And we have to choose. Uh, choose for ourselves what we are going to have and what we are going to be. Also, Joshua brought the people of Israel to confrontation. We can find it here in Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Amen? Elijah brought God's people to confrontation there in Mount Carmel. Amen? He said, choose between God and Baal. And the people kept quiet. They wanted to assume a position of neutrality. They wanted to straddle the fence. And they didn't want to go one way or the other. They just wanted to, you know, they wanted to compromise, have the best of both worlds. But brethren, we are being confronted this very moment with a choice. We're at, the, at a crossroads. Amen? There's only two, two roads. There's either it's God's way or it's Satan's way. And all you can do is incline your will in one or the other direction. There's no three wills. There's only really two wills in the, in the universe. Self-will is nothing else but what? It's, what? You have a right to choose either to go God's way or to go Satan's way. Now, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose salvation or damnation? Are you going to choose health or illness? Are you going to choose freedom or bondage? Are you going to choose fullness or emptiness? Are you going to choose prosperity or destitution? What are you going to choose? That's, that's the, the proof of the pudding tonight. That's why Jesus said to that man, Would you be made whole? That word whole means brought together all the pieces. See, his life had been shattered. His life had been fragmented. Amen? And Jesus was offering him a total restoration. In fact, there in, in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, when it talks about a, healing, uh, a man that was probably in a very similar condition to this one, it says that he was, uh, oh, what's the word? Perfect soundness. That's what God is offering us. We can be healed physically. We can be healed emotionally. We can be healed morally. We can be healed spiritually. We can be healed mentally. I, I mean, every disorder in our life can be healed if we want to. If we want to. The thing is, is we're satisfied being what we are and having what we have. We've, we've become accustomed to so little. Hmm? There's no great aspirations. Amen? You can have what you want. You can be what you want and you can do what you want. With God's grace. And with God's help. Amen? Now, I want to just give you a few more verses tonight. Some are looking at me rather bleary-eyed. But let's look at Matthew chapter... Uh, 23. How many can praise, say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Matthew 23, 37. Let me tell you, this message tonight can revolutionize your life. Can change the course of your life. The direction of your life. Amen? Can completely turn you around. Amen. Just listen to this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I... There's God's will. 
How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You refused. You revealed. God wanted to gather your people, like the hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. Why does the mother hen gather the chicks? And when does the mother hen gather the chicks? When there's danger. When the wolf's coming. When the coyote's coming. Amen? When there's a storm. All the little chicks are <laughs> know that they, they have to seek refuge under those wings. That as long as they're under those wings, they're safe. I think the chicks have more brains than <laughs> many of us Christians. <laughs> they knew what was right for them. They knew where to flee. Amen? And yet the Bible says, how often would I have protected you? How often would I have blessed you? But ye would not. That's the sad thing. Let me tell you, young man, young woman, let me tell you, brother, sister, tonight, God wants to do great things in your life, but he will never be able to do them until you are willing and ready to cooperate with him. <coughs> Amen? As long as you stubbornly seek to manage your own affairs, go your own way, drift into the world, into pleasure, into sin, you're going to wreak havoc upon your own life. And someday you'll be sorry, but it will be too late. That's true. Some people think there's always another chance. But many times there isn't. Many times there isn't. How many kids that have been reared in Christian homes and in Christian churches have destroyed themselves by the age of 18, 19, 20 because they rebelled against their parental authority. They rebelled against their pa parents, against their pastors. They chose their own way. They chose to live a self-centered life. And they ended up in the junk heap of history. Amen? Completely destroyed. Okay, let's look at another verse. Here in Isaiah, chapter 1. There's so much, there's so much we could share tonight, but I think I'm going to have to bring this quickly to an end. Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the fat, the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel... Ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of God has spoken it, and that establishes it forever. Amen? If you be willing, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse that you set your will against the will of God, then you will be devoured by the sword. That's the choice you have. There's only two ways. Amen? God's way or Satan's way? What are you going to choose? Choose ye today. You can't leave a, your choice off to someone on certain future. Huh? When, by then you would have messed your life up. <laughs> See? The decision you are going to make tonight might be the most important decision of your life. Amen? Amen. To depose that attitude of stubbornness, of willfulness, in order to go God's way. Amen? See, the Bible speaks much about rebellion. Self-will is nothing else but rebellion. Did you hear that? Self-will is nothing else but rebellion. Let me just read quickly about five or six verses about rebellion here in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as, as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. What does God liken rebellion and stubbornness to? Some of the worst sins that any human being could Satan worship. Idolatry is Satan worship. Witchcraft is Satan worship. Actually, when you are in rebellion to God, to His established authority, His delegated authority, you're in rebellion to your parents, you're in rebellion to your teacher, you're in rebellion to your uh, uh, pastors. You're actually following whom? Satan. You're practicing evil arts. Because the Bible says rebellion is as witchcraft and stubbornness as idolatry. It's, it's a grievous thing, brethren. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, we can't classify all sins. But perhaps there's no sin that is as damnable as the sin of rebellion. Amen? How many can say praise the Lord? Okay, let's go to Psalms. Quickly, brethren. Psalm uh, 60, Psalm 68. Uh, 68, 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. <laughs> desolation in the wilderness you'll have an endless wilderness experience if you choose to go your own way you'll feel empty and parched 
You'll find no satisfaction, no fulfillment in life. You know, there's a lot of women that want to be fulfilled, and so they choose a career. Uh, and against the advice of their husbands and against the advice of their pastors, they decide to go out in the world and earn a living. They want to be fulfilled in some kind of art or trade. But they end up in a wilderness. Amen? A wilderness is a, a, a terrible place. Just read what Deuteronomy says about a wilderness. Uh, it's a place of what? Scorpions and serpents. Desolation. And that's where the, the, rev, the rebels dwell. That's their living place. Uh, it's, it's a permanent state. Let's go on. You want to hear some more? Yeah. Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse 10 and 11. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought them down, brought down their hearts with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. <laughs> Brother, when you come to that state, you won't find help anywhere until you repent. Amen? Until you repent. <laughs> It says, those that were in affliction in iron, they were bound in fetters. They were in a spiritual prison house. Why? Because they rebelled against whom? God. Against God. They contended. <laughs> that means that they, uh, that word contempt is like mockery, derision. They laughed. They scoffed at God. They think they were too smart for, for God. And it says, therefore they were brought down. That's depression. And there was no one to help. You can go to the finest counselor, the finest psychiatrist, and you won't come out of that until you what? Until you repent. Amen? Oh, rebels are the most miserable people in the world. That's what I find. My personal experience and by ministry. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 17. Quickly, brethren. Verse 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. You know, rebellion is an evidence that you have an evil heart. An unregenerate heart. An evil man seeketh it's Proverbs 17, 11. An evil man seeketh only what? Rebellion. Now here's the consequence. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. That word messenger is angel in the original. Who is this cruel messenger? A demon. And of the most cruel kind. A sadistic demon. He'll take pleasure in just harassing and tormenting you. Huh? He'll make your life so miserable. See? Rebellion attracts demons, and demons of the worst kind. Uh, see, these are four warnings. <laughs> Let me tell you, young woman, young man, brother, sister, whoever you might be here tonight, you're still at the place where you can avoid a heap of trouble. Amen? Preventative medicine is better than curative medicine. Uh, you haven't crossed the threshold. You haven't gone... Beyond the point of no return. If you're here, it's the out of sheer mercy. God has brought you here so that you can turn your life around. Amen? You can turn your life around. Because God knows that that rebellion, those wrong choices, because rebellion leads to wrong choices, will bring you into a state of misery and vexation. You'll be a victim of Satan. Satan will acquire legal grounds and legal rights to just <laughs> do his worst. In your life. Amen? Amen? Let's go on. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to whom? To the prince of the power of the air. This is a big boy. This is not any second or third degree demon. He's not one of those little uh, imps. There's the prince of the power of the air... The spirit that now worketh where? In. Inside of. Inside of the children of disobedience. If you're a Christian and you're living in rebellion, you're living in disobedience, you have a spirit. And it's not a godly spirit, it's an ungodly spirit. And what is his name? He's a strong man. The spirit is called the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Amen? Where there's rebellion, there's always demons. Did you hear me? Where there's rebellion, there is always demons. Rebellion is a doorway. They enter. They filter. They enter, or they enter into an individual that lives in rebellion toward God and his authority. Amen? 
Now, let's go to 2 Timothy. And this is, I'm going to wrap it up with this passage of Scripture. And I'm going to ask Brother Charlie to get ready to make the invitation. I think God wants to call some people to repentance tonight. You have much to repent of because you've been in rebellion against God and against His Word and against His church. You've been in rebellion against your parents. You've been in rebellion against your teacher. You've been in rebellion against your pastor. You've been in rebellion against everything good. Okay? Now, notice what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 24, 25, 26. It says that the servant of God, verse 25, should be meek. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. This is a poor translation. And it says in meekness instructing those that are in opposition to him, to his ministry. I'm sure there's other versions here tonight. There's some of the more modern translations that correct this passage of scripture. It's talking about rebellion. The opposition and rebellion are the same thing. Now, a servant of God should be meek and he should try to instruct and correct those that are in rebellion. He shouldn't come hard down hard on them uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Now, notice what it says here in verse 25. If God peradventure will give them what? Repentance. Peradventure. What does peradventure mean? <laughs> By chance. It means that God's not obligated <laughs> to give them repentance unto life. For adventure, if, if a man of God will inter, intervene or intercede, if God, a man of God is will, with meekness and patience begin to deal with that person, God will honor that man and, and perhaps lead this person into re, repentance. See, but Brother Charlie had a message uh, about, uh, was it obedience, repentance, and deliverance? Okay. God's cruel. Cool. And he mentioned repentance and deliverance. And I, I rejoice listening to that because repentance is the... Prelude to deliverance. Amen? Amen. The prelude to repentance. The, why do many people come for prayer and nothing happens? Nothing stirs up within. And you bind and you rebuke and you, oh, you nearly lose your, your voice <laughs> dealing with those demons and they just won't budge. Why? Because uh, that person has not repented. That's the problem with a lot of, uh, many different kinds of sins. For example, the sin of homosexuality has been mentioned here several different times. It's very hard to get a homosexual to repent. He doesn't, re he doesn't really realize the gravity of his sin. See, when sin is pleasurable, and all sexual sins are pleasurable, at the moment that the sin is being committed, it, it, it provides a great deal of pleasure, doesn't it? And when sin is pleasurable, people don't realize that it is exceedingly sinful. See, many times we have to have a revelation from God. A revelation of what sin is and what sin does. What sin costs God and costs Jesus. Amen? And then we'll repent in sackcloth and ashes. Now it says here, if pure adventure, God will grant them what? Repentance to the acknowledging of truth and that they may recover themselves. And this word recover themselves is they might liberate themselves. Some versions that says they might come to their senses. Huh? But really the original meaning is that they might liberate themselves. They might be set free from this snare of the devil. See, when you rebel, you become a captive. You become a slave. What does the verse, how does the verse end right there? Verse 26, it says, They might recover themselves out of the snare of whom? Of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Does Satan have a will? And he tries to impose his will upon us. And many times we choose to do, we think we're choosing to do our own will, when actually we're choosing to do Satan's will. And we become pawns. We become slaves. And he just manipulates us any old way. He does whatever he wants to do with us. And we're powerless to resist. Doesn't that, isn't that what happens to the dope heads? Isn't that what happens to the alcoholics? They promise, they swear, they're going to stop. And they can't. Uh, they're driven. Uh, this is compulsory behavior. There's something inside of them that even though they might try to muster as much willpower as they can, they can't stop. Because they become what? Captives. Slaves. To Satan. Amen. What do they need? First repentance. And then deliverance. Amen. What is the remedy for rebellion? Repentance and deliverance. Amen. And brethren, we, some of us that are old and some of us that are young, we've made so many wrong choices that we've messed up our lives to the point where, humanly speaking, there's no... Remedy, humanly speaking. 
I qualified that. God has an answer, doesn't he? God has a cure. God can do great things, exceedingly abundantly, above anything we can imagine. But it's going to take what on our part? Repentance and then deliverance. Then we'll be, recover ourselves. Then be, we, we will be released from that demonic bondage. We'll come into freedom. That's what God wants us to. He, he wants to liberate our wills, brother. That's one of the greatest deliverances we can ever achieve is have a will that has been liberated and has been sanctified and has been surrendered to the will of God. We'll walk in victory all our lives. Amen? Brother, let me tell you tonight, you can choose between being healthy or sick, or you can be choose between being free or bound, or you can choose between being happy or miserable. It's your choice. You're a free agent. You can decide. Let me ask you, where... How are you going to incline your will? Are you going to incline it towards God or towards Satan? Are you going to line up your will with the will of God? Are you going to follow the example of the forerunner? He said, not my will, but thine be done. And though God's will seemed very painful at the, at the moment, because God's will was death, yet Jesus set his face like a flint. He locked in his will to do God's will. And that's the secret of happiness. And that's the secret of freedom. And that's the secret of success in our Christian life. Is to what? To do God's will. To choose what God would have us choose. And to decide what God would have us decide. Amen? Would you be made whole? Do you want to be healed? And do you want to be delivered? Do you want to be restored? Do you want to end into a life of fulfillment and happiness and satisfaction? Do you want to be what God has intended you to be from the foundation of the earth? You want to be victorious? Yes. Possible. Uh, it can be the process of recovery can begin tonight here. If you repent and if you submit to a deliverance prayer. Amen. Close your eyes if you'd like to. Again, if you're not committed to the Lord, you had to commit your life to the Lord tonight, we'd certainly want to take a moment to give you folks an opportunity. Um, if your life is not committed, only you can commit your life to God. No, no one else can do that. You must do that. Your mom can't do it. Your dad. Uh, nobody can do it but you. Perhaps this message tonight um, has been delivered for your salvation. Among many other things, I'm sure it's, it's served many purposes, but it may be the message that God designed for your salvation. And as uh, Brother Parrish said, you have to make up your mind whether you're going to just let it go by or you're going to grab hold of it and say, Lord, I will. Be saved. I, I want to be saved. I choose to be saved. Rather than to go out into a world, remember the choice you make is either going to be God's choice, which is I will let no man should perish, or it's going to be Satan's choice, which is uh, I will let all men perish. It's not, a, it's not a third choice. So you either got to say yes to God, I want to be saved, or yes to the God of this world, which is in effect I, I, I choose damnation. That's, that's the way the Bible says it without being too hard. So you can pray and just ask the Lord to come into your life. This is what his will is for you, that you should be saved. Say, I accept your will for my life, Lord. I accept your provision that was made for me on Calvary through the Lord Jesus Christ when he laid down his life and bore my iniquity, which is rebellion and all his evil consequences, where it pleased the Lord that he should suffer my judgment. Uh, I'll accept that as my um, sacrifice, and I'll just identify with Calvary and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and I'll choose to be saved. If you want to do that, you can do that right now, wherever you're seated. And the Lord will hear that prayer. And you can invite him to come into your life. And he'll come into your life. There's no question about it. We have scores of folks here. Any single one of you will tell you that that's just what happens. Your life has changed from, from that moment on. This is a testimony that can be testified by any believer. It's just a fact. That's, that's all there is to it. God comes in. <clears throat> and then for you believers that are present that want to pray this prayer, let's... Let's make a, a confession prayer, a positive confession prayer. If you'd like to pray this, I think it'll be good for us to uh, maybe drive out some, some old dingy spirits that are floating around and get our minds in a positive direction as far as God is concerned and His Word is concerned. Let's pray together if you'd like to, brother. Say, Father in heaven, I want to assert my will tonight as being your will. You have said in your Word to confess with our mouth and believe in my heart and I believe in my heart that your will for my life is all those things that the preacher showed us in the scriptures. Therefore, I want to confess with my mouth 
since I already believe in my heart. I will, Lord, to be made whole. I will, Lord, to repent of all sin, known sin and unknown sin. And take a moment and, and uh, take care of that known sin just right there where you may be. The Spirit of God I know was moving if Brother Paris was teaching. And there has to be conviction. The Holy Spirit has not withdrawn himself. God is not mad at us tonight. The grace period, the Bible said, and the preacher said, is still available. So that there had to be conviction. Let's take a moment to, well, what shall I say, capitalize on that, on that blessed work of the Holy Ghost who does the convicting. The preacher can't convict you. Only the Spirit of God and the Word that can convict you. So if you've been convicted, praise the Lord. And just go ahead and confess that. I know it's your will that I receive deliverance. I will to be delivered. I will to be prospered according to thy word. I will to live in victory by the Lord Jesus Christ. I will to take authority over my life. I will to destroy the works of the devil. I will to further the kingdom of God. I will to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will to do your will and by your grace and by your power I know that your will can be done on the earth and I'm on the earth and through me as it is in heaven through Jesus Christ I pray it everybody said amen this is the end of this message our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.